Whitewater, Wisconsin is a quaint, bustling college town from the outside perspective, but this town is more than what meets the eye. This town is host to surprisingly many secrets and lore anxiously waiting to be told. Looking at this town today, you wouldn't imagine it to be the dark and eerie setting for witchcraft and ghosts, but here we are, and Whitewater is just that. Everyone in the surrounding area knows of Whitewater, and many have made a visit at one point or another. But even fewer know of the town's historical past or current legends, filled with college students completely oblivious to the dark tales shadowing this small town. Man, that cross, where was that? Is that back that way? Oops. Sorry if I'm blinding ya. Oh. All right. What one is this? This is what one? Calvary? Calvary. Okay, yeah. So we're just at Calvary Cemetery, which is one of the cemeteries that forms the triangle um, of, the, of, I guess, the Whitewater Witches. And it's called the Second Salem out here. It's pretty creepy. And it's a full moon, so that's pretty awesome. And I got my friend Justin from Visually Creep TV yeah. and Laura. Oh no, I was just talking. <laughs> that full moon. I see that cross. Yeah, we weren't here much longer before, or like that long before you showed up. That seems pretty dead, guys. See, see that? That proves that that thing was going off at Astalan, y'all. Whitewater was originally founded entirely by settlers from the New England coast. These settlers were termed Yankees and descendants from the English Puritans who had arrived in the early pilgrimages of the 1600s. In the late 1800s, Whitewater would gain the nickname Second Salem. Many people believe this journey to infamy began in 1889 when Morris Pratt Institute was built. The institute would offer education in the ever popular idea of spiritualism. There was even a room in this college said to be strictly reserved for that as practices of seances. This room was termed the White Room, and rumors would abound that this was a school for witches in the making. So let us get into why Whitewater would receive its ominous nickname Second Salem. This would be because of the belief that many people believed witches were living among the populace. Three of these witches are more famous than the rest, however. And the first witch we'll be discussing today is Nellie Horn, a cold-blooded murderess that will leave you with an uneasy feeling, especially when you consider that sometimes the most evil people are our very own family. It was a full moon night when we visited Calvary Cemetery, where infamous Nellie Horn and her entire family are buried. There wasn't too much paranormal activity here, however, and being as it was very muddy and windy, I decided to take this opportunity to tell you guys the story of Nellie Horn. The Horn family was made up of six members. Joseph, Judith, had four daughters, Gertrude, Nellie, Anna, and Agnes. The only sister to not live in Whitewater was Gertrude. In 1882, Judith would pass a painful death very suddenly, and with symptoms simulating that of poisoning, though foul play was not suspected at first. Joseph would die, and I quote, of terrible spasms and convulsions a mere six weeks later than his wife. A $5,000 inheritance was left to be split among the four sisters. 
and a series of more than unfortunate events would occur. The first sister to fall victim to these unfortunate events was the youngest sister, 17-year-old Agnes. Agnes was said to have been left the largest part of her inheritance because of her young age, and she was also noted to have taken her father's death very hard. It wouldn't be long after Agnes's death that her sister Anna would follow suit. Anna would mysteriously fall ill, and it would be Nellie who would try unsuccessfully to nurse Anna back to health. It was said Nellie gave her sister a dose of opium powder only to have her pass just a few hours later. At the coroner's inquest, it would be found that Anna had died of a lethal dose of the chemical strychnine. Nellie was looking very suspicious to law enforcement, especially since it was said Nellie had allegedly purchased poison a few days prior for what she had said to been exterminate rats from her office. Nellie was subsequently put on trial, but was promptly acquitted. It was something of a common occurrence back in the day that the idea a lady could not commit such a crime, and no less your own kin. Of course, police to this day presume that Nellie Horn indeed poisoned her family, and she did it for the money. Nellie would live a full life. She got married and had children and died of an old age. No witches yet. Yet. You hearing that? Is it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a dog. <laughs> Werewolves and shit. Who knows, man? That beast of Bray Road ain't far. Yeah, Elkhorn's not far from here, so mm -hmm. watch out for that werewolf. Ooh, that one's real well traveled there. Same. You got the K2 meter, Laura? Oh man, you can see inside it? What? Oh, that's crazy. Look at this guy. Turn my lights off. Wow. Wow. Is there anybody in here? <laughs> Easy, Captain. Guess not. Hey, long gone. Man. Kind of old. Yeah, it does. Elling mode. That's a creepy name. Man, that thing is awesome. Oh. Did it? Yep. And it wasn't even on it. Nope. Is there anybody here? Nope. I don't think so. Our next stop in the triangle was Hillside Cemetery, the burial location of Myrtle Shoddy. In the 1920s in Whitewater, Wisconsin, Myrtle Shoddy, aged 36, was a wife to Edward Shoddy and mother of four children, ages 5 through 16. Life was rather mundane for the family in the quiet town, but looks are always deceiving. 
The family from the outside was a seemingly happy one, and everyone was well-liked by the neighbors and community. Myrtle was known as a model mother to well-behaved children, and Edward a capable, hard-working family man. The family had moved from their rural farm and into the town of Whitewater, where they would rent out rooms to the college students. It was when Ernest Coffell, 29, a student with the normal school, would take up room and board in the shoddy residence, and he and Myrtle would begin an affair. Following the spring of Ernest moving in, Edward Shoddy would fall ill, and after receiving a dose of what was deemed nighttime medicine, Edward would die the following day. Myrtle was said to have met up with Coffle dressed in her widow garb, where she and him discussed marriage and a future. Ernest said that they could be together, but not with the children, and this is where things get even darker for the Shoddy family. Myrtle then takes poison candy and borrowed cars she planned to have the vehicle crash and make it look like an accident. But last minute, she had a change of heart and demanded the children spit out the candy or they would be poisoned. Her middle son, however, did not believe his mother, and he swallowed the strychnine-laced candy. Myrtle then panicked and immediately took the boy to a physician. The boy did take ill, but he did make a full recovery. Law enforcement was alerted, and Myrtle confessed, though she tried to blame Ernest in the death of her husband. On the birthday of her youngest child, Myrtle was sentenced to 40 years in Wapan prison. She would ultimately only serve five years when in 1929, she would receive a pardon by then Governor Zimmerman and would be released. Something I always think I hear is footsteps. What? Something I always think I'm hearing is footsteps. Yeah, I've just been kind of stopping and listening. I'm like, I'm hearing birds, See, it's damn dog. I got another sign, do not enter. <laughs> What is that? Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Man, that thing is crazy looking. Alright guys, so we're... Yeah. We're coming up on this pretty neat looking... Yeah, I was just going to say, what is that? Memorial or something. I see a lot of people... Yeah, a lot of people have already walked on it. Try to find a spot. Wow. Whoa. Oh man, that's slick. It's like making it better. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't do that, Justin. You'll be the first. <laughs> And it probably won't be the last. Holy man, that's crazy. Sit and pray? Yeah. I have no idea. I don't know, this is creepy though. Oh, mm -hmm. it did. did it? Yeah. Did it blink? Shut up. It's almost spring now. I have to probably making their way back. Is there anybody here? Gray. Anybody named Gray? I'm gonna make our meter blink again. You heard that? Yep. yep. I heard that. It was like a person's voice. That was weird. <laughs> Close. <sighs> I agree. Is that another crypt down there? Man, I'm just, I can't, you know, because I don't know what's over this. So it's, 
I'm sorry, girl. Some damn duck. Yeah, there it is. I want to see that big crypt down there. Yeah, we're gonna have to look that up. Oh man, there's some big crypts. Yeah, look yeah, at what that. The hell? We gotta get over there. Yeah, we do. Oh yeah. Holy, this is huge. Yeah. It's like a drop off. This is like a whole drop off. Oh shit. Oh, that's deep. Oh my god. That's really deep. Yeah, <laughs> that was way deeper than I thought. I'd be careful. Be really careful. Don't die, Justin. Yeah, it's deep. Oh, wow. There really isn't too much on the life of Morris Pratt. It is said, however, that his passion for spiritualism stemmed from a visit to the Lake Mills Spiritualist Center in 1851. Morris was a rather controversial figure of his time, being the founder of a school nationally recognized for being the mecca of spiritualism, in a time of strict faith and values, was bound to have its fair share of controversy. According to the lore, Pratt was, and I quote, one day told by his Red Indian guide of a certain mineral deposits unknown by any other white man. Pratt made an investment in a company soon to become the Ashland Mine of Ironwood, Michigan, a very fruitful investment indeed. Pratt always said if he'd strike it rich, he would absolutely donate to spiritualism. Clearly, he kept his word and would construct the Pratt Institute. It would be in 1946 that the foundation, building and all, would relocate to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where it still stands to this very day. What? You could probably look in the top there, huh? Yeah, look at this. Is it open? Oh, dude, that looks open. Oh, that's creepy. Oh, there's a chain on. Yeah, but dude, you can see right in the top there. Peed a little. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you did. You <laughs> gave me a heart attack. Almost broke my camera. What? There's like some red. Man, I don't want to be put in there. Yeah, it's like, like that fencing. That red fencing. What's in there? Show me your secrets. But when I looked up the, I think the picture had something about like this being like one of the haunted spots. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Well, oh yeah, look, look at, at that. that. Yeah. That's what he was talking about. That yeah, like dungeon. Evil door or something. If that's a thing. Hello. Something knocks back. Is there anybody with us? <laughs> like a classic that'd be, that'd be way door too knocker. Easy if that actually opened, I'd be like, "Yep, there's oh, something going on here." That's messed up. That's like a double bolted door. Yeah, why? Triple bolted. Look at that. They like welded it shut too. Yeah. 
Damn, what do they no got in, in there? there? What's in there? Out. What's all oh, the names like gone too? It says 18 maybe? Yeah, like. Huh. What was this name? All the way up on the Public. <laughs> Public what? <laughs> Man, these are old. Hans J. Dalen. Yeah. Oh man, that's cool. Van Van Brewers. Oh, they protected it. Is old. The last witch we will be covering in today's case is Mary Worth. Now, Mary Worth is the only one whose resting place isn't exactly known. Mary Worth isn't even as concrete as our other two witches were, and in fact, she's really the only one out of the three to even proclaim herself to be a witch. She's more of a legend than anything, but her story continues nonetheless. In the 1860s, many of today's historic whitewater homes were a part of the Underground Railroad, and the tunnels beneath would play a part in the secrecy of witches. One witch in particular was a cruel and spiteful woman. Her name was Mary Worth. It was said that Mary would lure slaves from the South with prospects of freedom, only to have them resold back into slavery for the money. Rumor and legend also have it that Mary would partake in torturing slaves as well as sacrificing them for her rituals. Eventually, the townsfolk grew tired of Mary and her barbaric ways, and it was said that a lynching mob was formed, and they hung Mary Worth on her own property. People believe either Mary was buried on her property, or at Oak Grove Cemetery, where people are said to have seen her among the graves. Mary Worth is Wisconsin's version of Bloody Mary, and her legend and spirit supposedly live on to this day. No, they say that they perform rituals here. Oh, that thing goes way up. Wow. So, they say that rituals are performed here to keep something inside this tower, but what, yeah, we don't like know. Points on top of the fence. They said that they like aimed inward, but I don't see that. Yeah, it looks straight. Yeah, it's, it's like a normal this fence. This is where they do some seances and sacrifices. Sacrifices? Yeah, supposedly sacrifices. Supposedly there's ritual, like protection rituals. And I, this is the. There's a tunnel connected to a campus. Yeah, one of the campuses, like an underground tunnel, where they said that they would be able to, like, like legit witches would come out walk here. through incognito, so people didn't know that they were coming here to do whatever they were doing. What is that? Like a little porch up there. Yeah, it is. This thing is awesome. Our last visit on this night was Starin Park, and in this park was the legendary Witch's Tower. It is here that people have claimed witches have gathered to perform their rituals and seances, and a little history of the park dates the old water tower back to the 1800s. It said witches used to traverse the underground tunnels to get to meetings in secrecy here. Rumors of witches in Whitewater have been around long before the Institute, and what rituals were being done here is unknown. But this legend still stands strong, and the last known witch sighting at the tower took place in the early 90s when people claimed to have witnessed robed figures gathering around the tower. It's awesome. Oh, are you? We're getting some hits on the K2 over there.
Yeah, this thing goes way all the way around. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're getting some blinks. Yup. Oh, man. Man, look at it going. Yeah, I know, like with all these buildings around. Oh, Well, it is. Wow, that's deep. This story wouldn't be complete without a legend of a cursed book. It is said that the Anderson's library holds a cursed black book that had to be kept under lock and key in the library's basement. So the story goes that even casting your eyes upon the forbidden pages, you'd be driven to commit suicide. Many townsfolk whispered to students who'd already fell victim to the book's fate, as well as a professor talks of another student needing to be locked away in an asylum. Just another victim of the cursed book, they'd claim. Of course, these are all just stories and folklore, right? Well, we really don't know. No such book has ever been located at the library, and thus legend remains a complete yet fascinating mystery. Whitewater certainly holds its fair share of unsolved mysteries and legends and lore. Thanks for coming along with us today.